and uh, it is great to be together today, and uh, what a special day, Father's Day. And I'm excited to be able to jump into our Father's book as we have a, a, a Bible study. And, you know, having children will definitely change your life. And it is great for me to have my firstborn child with me. Callie's here today. You know, it says in Genesis 5, verse 22, it says, After he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked with God. And the Bible, the Holy Spirit saw fit to note that it was after he became a father that this man started to walk with God. And Callie was born July 22nd in 1998 in San Diego, California. And I was baptized by November 15th, 1998. So after she was born, that's when God really called me and I was able to start walking with him. And so thank you. Thank you, Callie. I wouldn't be here without you. And there's something about having a child that makes you start to think about stuff. It really wakes you up. And I, I do believe in a great way that God wants us to think about some things today. As we celebrate Father's Day, let's turn over here to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. And we're going to pick it up in verse 23. This is an incredible passage if we really take in what it says to us. It says here in verse 23, Jesus replied, anyone who loves me, he will obey my teaching. My father will love him and will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. I mean, this is incredible. Here Jesus says, whoever loves me is going to obey me. And then me and God, we're going to come and we're going to make a home with that person. That they're going to come into our family. That he would then become a son, a daughter of God. I mean, isn't that incredible? To think that the one that said, let there be light, the one that separated the sky from the land, the one that separated the water from the land, the one that designed a soul, that he says, if you love me, you obey me. Man, now you're going to live with me, and I'm going to be your father, and you're going to be my son or daughter. And didn't the Hoaglands do such an incredible job, really just bringing us to the cross and why God loves us? You know, but it's, a, it's an amazing thing that throughout history and, and even our times now, you know, there's so many stories of children who've lost connection with their father and have searched to find him. Even at our last congregational, uh, Jackie Chavez got up and shared on how she did not know her father and she finally found him and searched for him for many years and finally found him. And I know that's, that's many even stories of people here today did not know their father. You know, but rarely do you find a story of a father who's lost connection with his children and is now searching to find them. But interestingly, that is actually my father's story, my physical father. You know, believe it or not, I have a Puerto Rican sister. And uh, my, my dad was, as a young man, married in Puerto Rico, and he had a, a, a daughter there. And then he had a fallout of the relationship, and he went back to Chicago, and, you know, her, her, the, his wife at the time, her parents are political and this and that, and so he really lost connection with his daughter on the island of Puerto Rico. And we always grew up knowing that there was this long-lost sister out there. He had this long lost daughter out there. And then years and years later, when I was 17 years old, we, we finally found Nadia, my Puerto Rican sister. And she's an amazing, amazing woman. And it's just an amazing story of finally being united. My dad finally be united with his child that he lost. 
but it's my dad's story, but it really is the story of the Bible. It's a story of a father who has lost connection, not due to any fault of his own, but has lost connection with his children. And one book after the other, one chapter after the other is, is chronicling this father's search for his children. It talks about this in Acts 17. Let's turn over there. Acts 17 in verse 24. It says, the God who made the world, verse 24, and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men and breath and everything else. And from one man, he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine is being like gold, silver, stone, or an image made in man's design. You know, this is an interesting part of the book of Acts. It's where Paul goes to Athens, and he's in the Areopagus, and he's talking to some of the most brilliant minds of the time. And it's really cool because Sarah and I, years ago, got a chance to go to Athens. And it's an incredible, we literally got to stand on the Areopagus, which is kind of like this big boulder that's overlooking the city of Athens. And so to be in the very footsteps of where Paul once was. And here he's trying to appeal to these guys who believe in Greek mythology. One of the big transitions of mythology in ancient times was if you look at Egyptians and other people of the other societies, they kind of mesh this heaven and earth. They would have these human figures with like a wolf head. You ever seen those Egyptian things? Or an eagle head, but a human body. Where the Greeks, they thought that the human body was the pinnacle of creation. And so if you look at Greek mythology, Zeus, Hermes, all these were just looked like human beings. And so he's appealing to their Greek mythology, and he's going, hey, one of your own poets has said, we are his offspring. But he said, no, no, it was not that. The, we are the real offspring of God. And he created everything, and he set the times and places, and he's put the exact moments in your life where he, he's really put people there so that at that moment somebody invites you out to church, asks you to study the Bible, or even you come in here today. And he wants to have a relationship with you. He's been seeking you your whole life. It doesn't matter what just happened this last week or this last year. He knew you before you were born. And he set this time for you to reach out and find him. Though he's never been far from any one of us. You know, it's such a sad story at the same time. Because this scripture reads the same whether you read it or somebody in India reads it. Whether somebody in Indiana reads it. That God has worked so hard. He's been searching for his children for so long. And he does so much work. He makes himself so vulnerable of setting the times and places. But the key word in the passage is perhaps. The perhaps is your will in it all. Your willingness to reach back out to God as he's reaching out to you. And this is what we're here today. We're here to talk about Father's Day. You know, Father's Day is great because it's a day where the father, the, the dad gets to do whatever he wants. You get to eat where dad wants to eat. You get to watch sports if that's what is on tonight. You get to do whatever dad wants. And so today, we're just going to look at what our dad wants. That this is what we're going to study out today. And, and, and really the title of my lesson for you is very simple. It's the Father's Day. Wow. 
And I only have one point for you. And this is what our Father wants. Our Father wants our willingness. This is what he wants. He wants our willingness. Let's turn over here to 1 Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter five, and we're going to pick it up in verse one. It says, to the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's suffering, and one who will also share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not greedy for money, but eager to serve. Not luring over those entrusted to you, but being an example to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive your crown of glory that will never fade away. You know, here... Peter, much later in his life, is appealing to the older brothers in the church, the elders. And he's saying, hey, guys, you're here to take care of, to oversee the church. But do it not because you, you, you got to do it. Don't go to church because somebody dragged you to church. Don't give because somebody dragged you to give. Don't do it because you know if you don't, this is going to happen or that's going to happen. No, but because you're willing to do it. Because you want to do it. See, it says this is how God wants you to be. And from the very beginning, this is what God has been searching the generations for. It says in Titus 2 that, that Jesus came to purify for himself a people of his very own. His children, his sons and daughters who are eager to do what is good. Who are willing you know, at the end of the day, what Christianity is about is surrendering our will to God's will. That's what it's about. You know, Luke 22, as Jesus was preparing to go to the cross, what did he say? Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, but not by my will, but by your will. He showed us what it's about. It's about surrendering our will. And going, Father, I want to do this. I want to do that. I'm afraid of this. I'm afraid of that. But you said this. And you said that. And you promised this. And you showed me that. Therefore, it's not by my will. But it's by your will. Here's my life. You do with it what you will. But the reality is, is this is a very ugly process. It's very ugly. I mean, you could take the biggest, strongest dude in the gym. And, and this guy, man, just, just ripped. No. And then you can sit down and study the Bible with them and call them to surrender will. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, and they can become the scaredest, more fearful, you know, just freaking out person you've ever yeah. seen in your life. Yeah. Because it's an ugly process. It takes a strength. It takes a conviction to surrender one's will to God's will. It's the moments where faith is actually lived out. Yeah. You know, from what I can see, there's really two levels of struggling in your willingness. And we're going to talk about them a little bit today. Let's talk about the first level of struggling. This is what we're talking about. We're not talking about like cranking. We're talking about struggling here. All right. Let's look over here at Matthew 21. Matthew 21 and verse 28. It says, what do you think? It's a good question. There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. And he answered, I will, sir, but did not go. 
which one did what his father wanted? The first they answered, Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, the tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you and showed you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. And the tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe. You know, here Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees. And he's using a parable to convict them. And he goes, God had two sons. The first one, he went to them and he said, hey, go work in the vineyard. Do what I want you to do. Make my will your will. And he said, I'm not going to go. He said, darn it, i got to go. And then he went. <laughs> the other one goes, yes, yeah, of course I'll go. Yes, sir. <laughs> and then went off and played Xbox or something like that. <laughs> Now, the context is that he's talking to the Pharisees, and he asks them which one did what God wanted him to do. And they answer, they go, hey, the first one, and then he goes after them. So who is Jesus implying that they are? They're the second one. That they come to church, they look good, they, they dress the parts, they sing the songs, but when the rubber meets the road, when it's time to make your will match God's will, they don't actually do it. Now, the first one is ugly. It doesn't look good. But at the end of the day, it's still willing. This is the first level of struggling to make your will match God's will. This is why Jesus makes one of the founding convictions of being a disciple. you got to deny yourself. Because there's going to be time. I love to tell you and get up here and say, every time it's time to preach a lesson. Every time it's time to sing a song. Every time it's time to give contribution. Every time it's time to fellowship or go to Devo or do this or do that or have a deep time. I just, I'm just so giddy and excited to do it. No, no, no. That's not the, the reality of the situation. And there's times where I go, oh. Okay, I got to do it. Because I know what Christianity is about. That even in your struggling, it's time to make God's will match my will. And to do what he wants me to do, even when I don't want to do it. Now, anybody who has children knows that you still appreciate this. Like with, with my son, Mickey, I may ask him, Mickey, can you go clean your room? And almost every time he'll be like the first son. But the fact that he still does it, I still feel great about it. I still feel very encouraged. In fact, God feels more encouraged because he sees you struggling to obey him. He sees that you're willing to go through that. And despite self, you're going to do what he wants you to do. And in that moment, Christianity is really being lived out. It comes in the struggle. So if you struggle this morning, but you're here. If you struggle to give contribution, but you did it. If you're struggling to make missions, but you're going to make it. Don't get down on yourself. You're living out Christianity. It, it's in the struggle that it happens. Let's look at this over here in Psalm 51. This is the first level of struggling. But then, if we're not careful, we can get to the second level. And David talks about it in Psalm 51. We're going to pick it up in verse 5. This is when you're in a bad place right here. It says, surely I was sinful at birth. Surely. From the time my mother conceived me. You know, sadly, and this scripture gives birth to one of the oldest false doctrines in history. Known as original sin. Yeah. And it's taking the, the scripture out of context. David has just tanked out miserably as the king and he's gotten caught up in adultery. And he's speaking in like poetic hyperbole where he's saying, I was sinful at birth. I, you know, I'm so sinful. I was sinful even when I was conceived. Now, you cannot be sinful when you're conceived. You don't even have a brain yet. 
It talks about Ezekiel, the one who, the soul who sins is the one who dies. So he, he, he's not meaning that you're born sinful. He's just speaking out like a man that's really having a hard time. You ever say this always happens to me? Does it really always happen to you? No, it actually happens to you not very often. But now that it's happened to you, it's so bothered by it. You say, wow, this always happens to me. That's what David's talking about here. He goes on. He says, surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my inequity. Create me a pure heart of God and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. And the church said, Amen. you know, here he's like, God, please just forgive me. Yeah, I mean, you ever blown in and just go like, what's wrong with me? Yeah. Like, just what's wrong? Like, who sinned? This is my parents' fault. Like, who did this? And you just want to be on the other end of the struggle. You just want this behind you. And this is where David's at. He's like, God, just wash me. Just clean me. Just allow me to get through this struggle. Just hide your face from my sin. Just blot out my inequity. Then he goes, God, create in me a pure heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. What is he saying? I was once there. I was once steadfast. I was ready. Whatever I could do, I was eager to do what was good. But now because of my sin, I've lost touch of that. God, I've lost the joy of your salvation. God, grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. You know, I, I'm somebody who has lost my salvation. I've walked away from God before. And I'll never forget, you know, I came on the mission team here in 2007. and was so excited about what God was going to do on this mission team. I was so fired up and it was so amazing. And Kip had just such an incredible way of leading the church and it was amazing. With, with the 42 disciples, we had 104 baptisms that first year. Wow. It's incredible. And, you know, I, I went through a lot in that time period of my life. I didn't have the conviction to sustain the hardship. I didn't see God as my father who was teaching me and, and training me and trying to get me to be more. And so when, when things didn't work out, I had this kind of Hollywood version of Christianity. And when the Hollywood version of Christianity didn't match up with real Christianity... And I didn't have convictions about real Christianity. I lost my faith. But I didn't just walk away right away. I slowly started to sin more and more and more. And I remember I came down to a faithful night. I was either going to go to a service or I was going to go out with some people in the world that I was working with. And I remember just counting the cost. We count the cost about many things. And I counted the cost and made the decision not to go. And to go out with these people in the world. And I, and I told myself that, okay, I, I'm going I'm to blow it here. And then I'm going to get back up. And, and I'm going to get back up and I'll repent. And it's all going to work out. And that brother kind of did something like that. And, that, and he kind of was able to get through it. And I think I'll get through it too. You know how we use people's sin to justify what we're doing and we think that it's okay? And I talked myself into it. The Bible says sin deceives you. And I totally talked myself into the sin... And I totally tanked out and totally blew it and didn't do what that one brother did and got back up. And I'll never forget, I drifted further and further and further away. And then I stopped coming to things. And then I remember one day, I get a knock at my door. And it's Raul and Ricky. And they go, hey. Yeah, like I had a buddy in there and we're in a Lotus Inn. And so they go, hey, why don't you come out and talk to us? And so I, I go out. I'll never forget Raul and Ricky just pleading with me to repent. Like two brothers. Like, bro, just, you could do this. You could get back up. God has a great plan. Like everything. And I remember that I had just lost the, the willing spirit. Wow. I lost it. Wow. I remember telling Raul and Ricky, I go, 
guys, I, I love you. I love the church. This is the truth. This is awesome. I'm just done. And that was it. I fell away. Wow. I lost a willing spirit. Wow. And I had to go through a whole bunch of hardship before I realized that, wow, the world is totally lost. Wow. And there's nothing back in this dying city for me. Yeah. And I had to go through that for about another year. And I'll never forget. I was like, what am I doing? I've got to go back to my father. And I, I was so grateful that God had enough grace on me that he allowed me to come back. He allowed me to come to my senses. And on May 23rd, 2010, I got restored back to my heavenly father. And I'll never forget when I got restored in Long Beach. I told myself, I'm always going to be willing to do whatever God wants me to do. I beg God, restore that willing spirit. Allow me to be fired up. I spent years as a lukewarm Christian. I spent years as one foot in and one foot out, trying to do the bare minimum, trying just to fly by and be in the middle of the fellowship of the church and do the bare minimum to keep it going. And it was miserable. I would dare say some of us are there today. Just trying to plug along and just keep enough, or I went this enough and that enough, and not really giving God a willing spirit. Wow. It, it's unsustainable, as the scripture says. You need a willing spirit that sustains you. They go, God, whatever you want me to do, I'm going to surrender my will to your will. You know, I, I've always loved the, the story of the prodigal son. And... This son goes and he blows it in wild living. It says he comes back to his senses and then comes back to his father. And the, the depiction the Bible gives us that his father was waiting the whole time. I remember when I came back, I thought for sure they're going to be like, Jason can't do anything. Put Jason over there and let's just make sure that he doesn't hurt anybody. Because I was notorious. I was, I was bad. And I was so grateful that it was like, no, here, here, lead this. No, do this. No, do that. Just like the father. Here's the robe. Here's the ring. Let's have a celebration. And I was brought back into the house in such an incredible way. You know, I love here in verse 13, it says, after you've been restored a willing spirit, it says, then I'll teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. And once I got that willing spirit back, wow, it was amazing what God has done. We got the opportunity to go to Las Vegas and see all that God did in Las Vegas and how many people got their lives right with God and then go to San Francisco and see it go from 50 to 450. And now here in the city of angels and know that we're almost at 1,000 for the Lord. And that guy who fell away on the LA mission team, now by the grace of the Father, can lead the LA church. But what could God do in your life today? What could God do in your life today? If you make a decision to let his will be your will. Let's look here at Matthew 26. We're going to close out here. Matthew 26. It says in verse 40. This is, this is the beating heart of Christianity here. It says, then he returned to his disciples. It found them sleeping. Couldn't you men not keep watching me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray. So that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing. But the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed. My father. If it is not possible for this cup to be taken from me. Unless I drink it. May your will be done. When he came back. He again found them sleeping. Because their eyes were heavy. So he let them and went away once more. And prayed a third time. Saying the same thing. Then he returned to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near. The Son of Man has been betrayed in the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. 
you know, we read this scripture when we do a, a study with people called the cross study. And I always tell them, you're going to have many Garden of Gethsemane moments in your life where you have to bring yourself back to your father. And despite the struggle, despite how hard it's become, despite all the tragedy or even triumph that has come into your life, you have to surrender your will to his will. And I believe in this scripture, it gives us the blueprint on how to do it. What he said, he goes back three times and prays. And this is my challenge for every disciple who's here this morning and maybe feels like you've lost some of that willing spirit. Is to go and pray until you get it back again. To get to a place of surrender where you know what? I, 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 I'm done with lukewarmness. I, I'm done with giving what's easy. I'm done with doing the minimum. No, I, I'm going to give my best. I'm going to give it all I got. Yeah. I'm going I'm to be fruitful. I'm going to help people get their lives right with God. I'm going to be about God's purposes and not choked out by my own. Yeah. I'm going to lay my life down. If you've squirmed off the altar, then I'm going to get back up and put myself on the altar. And I'm going to allow God's will to be my will. Go and pray this week until that has happened. You know, the body is weak. And that's why it takes prayer to get the body's will to match the spirit's will. And I believe God has given us an incredible opportunity to show our repentance and our faith as we're going to plant 32 churches this year. This church alone is sending out seven mission teams, the last of which will go out next Sunday at our mission service. And God has done incredible things. But today is about what God wants. And what our Father in Heaven wants, He wants all to be saved and come to a knowledge of truth. That's what He wants. It may not be our desire that the people in Latin America or India or Africa be saved, but it is God's desire. It's what He wants to have happen. And if we would make our will match His will, God would do incredible things. And I believe today, and I believe next Sunday is a time for us to show God, no, 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 not by my will, but by your will. Yeah. And I'm going to lay down my life and I'm going to make sure that I blow out my special yeah. missions contribution. Yeah. I believe we could blow it out yeah. and we could see these mission teams planted and we're going to see God's will being lived out in this generation. You know, in 2 Corinthians 8, it says, for if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable. If the willingness is there, you know what? If you miss your goal, but you gave it all you got, it's acceptable. But let us take heed what was shared today by the Calamores and their contribution. Don't come empty handed. Give your best to God. You know, if you're our guest here today, I want to ask you to be willing, willing to study the Bible. Study the Bible. Find out more of what God has in store for your life, that God can transform your life. If God could transform my life going on 25 years ago, then God could transform your life. And you're sitting amongst a group of people who are not perfect, far from it. But this is our standard and it is the word of our father in heaven. And because we had the willingness to study it, it changed everything completely and it could change your life as well. You know, in Revelation 3, Jesus says to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my, on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. I was thinking about this scripture this morning. Jesus says, if you're victorious, if, if you stay surrendered, if you make your will match God's will for a lifetime, then you're going to sit down on the throne with Jesus. Then where is Jesus sitting? On the throne with God. You're going to be right next to your father. And when we get there and we could say that we did it, we overcame the world, 
We went to the garden as many times as it took to stay surrendered. Even when we were struggling, we still went and did what God wanted us to do. And when we see our Father one day in heaven as we gather around the throne, I tell you, my brothers and sisters, that will be the true Father's Day. I love you guys very much.